but I actually think this is quite elegant. Very short expression, and it summarizes exactly what we wanted to say. So last time we discussed curvature of curves in three dimensions. But something quite neat and a little bit different happens when the curve is in two dimensions. So if we consider a planar curve, and the same would be true for curves on surfaces, and also for surfaces in the three-dimensional space. And commonality among all of these uh, constructs is that such objects are hypersurfaces. <laughs> it's not a, it's a long word, but it's a very simple concept. It's when the dimension of the object you're studying is one less than the dimension of the ambient space, the space that it's in. So when a curve is in the plane, the curve is one dimensional because we only need one parameter to describe it. The plane, I like to call it the ambient plane, the plane that the curve is in is two dimensional. So two minus one is one. So there's one additional dimension. And if you imagine a surface in the three dimensional space, it's also lacking a single dimension compared to the ambient space. And what that gives you is a natural concept of the normal direction because there's only one dimension left in which to go. So the normal direction becomes unique within choosing between a vector and minus that vector. So let's contrast it with the curve in the three-dimensional space. If you have a curve in the three-dimensional space, then there is an entire plane orthogonal to it. So the normal space is two-dimensional. And yes, we did find a very special way to choose one of those infinitely many directions, and that was called the principal normal. But that required uh, more. That required differentiation and the concept of thinking about curvature. So that required a little bit more. When you're dealing with a hypersurface, uh, you automatically have a normal direction because there's only one dimension left. And so here's the unit normal. I can just define it in pure geometric terms without going to differentiation. So for hypersurfaces, we have an extra element that we don't have for curves and surfaces in higher dimensional spaces. Here we have it automatically. And we can call it the unit normal. And the only choice is the sense. Does it point this way or does it point the other way? And both, are, both choices are equally good. And it is completely arbitrary. The only thing that we're able to do is to say, all right, we'll choose the normal to point in this direction. What we then want to do is when we extend this idea to other points, we want to do it in a continuous way. We don't want to say that, okay, at this point, the normal will point this way. And then at this point, we'll choose the normal that points this way. And then at this point, we'll choose the normal, the normal that points this way. And you're not consistent. We also have an opportunity to make it consistent, which is to make one choice and then say at all the other points, I want to define my normal in such a way that the entire field of normals is continuous. So I think that's very intuitive. If I didn't use a sophisticated word like continuous, I could have just said consistent, and you would all know what it means. And then, of course, some uh, curves will throw us for a loop, and then we'll just avoid those curves. For example, if you have a curve like this, right, then it is hard to define a consistent normal. And actually, that's not so much the challenge, because you can't define a consistent normal. It's just that it'll have a kink. So here we go. We'll choose this direction. We can think of it as outward, because this curve is closed, right? It encloses an area. And so we go, 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 go in a consistent way. And by the time we get here, now it starts pointing inward. And so our outward pointing normal uh, would not be consistent, right? It'll have a discontinuity right here. So that's what happens with self-intersecting curves. The, what we would call the outward normal might not be continuous. So that's interesting, but 
So for now, let's not consider self-intersecting curves. And in any case, our focus has been on local properties. And even though later today we'll talk about integration, and that by definition is a global operation, our interest is more in local properties, right? We basically consider a point and a small interval around it and consider derivatives. Our entire discussion has been local. And the problem that might occur with a self-intersecting shape is global. It's in the global sense that we're not able to define a consistent outward normal. Or if we do say that our normal is outward facing, then we have a point with a singularity. So one way or another, right, because here the normal will point this way and here the normal will point this way, and it's not continuous at this point. So one way or another, a self-intersecting curve will present a problem, but we can ignore it. And not ignore it, but save it for later. Of course, it's a fascinating question. If your aesthetics lie towards topology, then it's that maybe this question is even more interesting than some of the local questions. But it so happens in calculus that sometimes understanding the local dynamics helps you understand what happens globally as well. Okay, so, and actually if you think about it, that's something that I missed. Because if we have a curve like this that's not closed, then the choice between the two available normals at every point is completely arbitrary. Ah, so if I bring this one back, we can't say that this one is any more special than this one. Right, what are you going to say? How are you going to single this one out? You can't say it points up, because really there is no such thing as up in geometry. It's only when you have gravity then you start having a sense of up. So there's absolutely no way to single out this normal over this normal. And so the choice of which normal is completely arbitrary, which normal to use. Okay, however, if a curve is closed, like this, what a nice, simple, closed curve, right? Then you can say an outward normal and an inward normal. And then I think the outward normal is more natural, but of course it's not more natural. It's just that we're more used to it. If you have a closed surface and somebody, surface, or in this case a curve, and somebody asks you to draw the normal field, I think nine out of ten people would start drawing something like this. Do you guys agree with me? I think so. So it's maybe something that we're a little bit more uh, used to, but in any case, the point is that you can at least distinguish between the two, and you can say outward normal and inward normal, two different normals. So what's the implication for curvature? So again, we're looking at a planar curve like this, and as you know, uh, or maybe this is I'm me reminding you, the curvature normal will always point inward like this, we denoted by the letter B. Inward, right? Because, yeah, you can say inward because we have an idea of the curve curving, and so we kind of think of it as like instantaneously a circle, and a circle definitely has an inward direction and an outward direction. So we can say that with respect to the curve, the curvature normal always points inward. And if you recall, its length was called sigma, and so the curvature normal was the curvature times the principal normal, which also pointed inward. And sigma was always a positive quantity. There was just no way to give it a sign. But now that we're dealing with a hypersurface, which, give us, which gives us the concept of the normal before differential analysis ever starts, we can now say whether the curve curves positively or negatively with respect to the normal field that we have arbitrarily chosen. And so the way you define signed curvature, and the term that I prefer even though it makes no sense for curves, is mean curvature, it will make sense, I think in the next lecture, for surfaces, the word mean will make sense. And it's denoted by kappa, it will have a sign. I will define it the following way. So to use words, I will define it to 
equal precisely sigma if the normal that we arbitrarily chose points in the same direction as the curvature normal. So suppose that before we started differential analysis and got the curvature normal, we said, all right, we have a curve in the plane, it's a hypersurface, which means it's endowed with the normal field, so let's just choose to point it this way. What does it mean for it to point this way? Well, I can't give it any other adjective. I can't say down, I can't say up, right, because the curve might start doing this. I can't say inward, I can't say outward. All I can say is that out of the two available directions, I chose, or I should say senses. Remember we introduced the word sense? So we have a choice of two orientations, and the choice is completely arbitrary. But let's assume that before we started doing differential analysis, we made that arbitrary choice. And now we have a curve and the normal field. And so now we evaluated the curvature normal, which was not arbitrary at all. It's predestined by the choice of the curve. As soon as you have the curve, you have this vector B, the curvature normal, you have its direction, you have its sense, you have its magnitude. It's just preordained by the curve. Okay, uh, and now we already have the normal, which had been an arbitrary choice, but we already made it. We had already made it. And so now we'll say that kappa equals sigma if the curvature normal and our choice of normal point in the same direction. And we will say that it's minus sigma if it points in the opposite direction. So with this arbitrary choice of the normal, we would say that kappa is positive. And we would say that the curvature of this curve is positive. Mean curvature, sine curvature, right? And of course, uh, we get sloppy and just call it curvature, in which case you have to have a common context and you need to specify, are you talking about this curvature or are you talking about this curvature? So in my book, I try to give a terminology to distinguish. I call this signed curvature, and this is unsigned curvature. I try to call this the absolute curvature, or in this, the mean curvature. But terms are difficult to remember, and I'm really not into introducing more and more adjectives that uh, anyone would need to remember. Uh, but you do have to have common context and specify what, which one you're talking about. Okay, so with respect to this choice of the normal, the curvature of this curve is positive. Had we chosen the normal to point in the opposite direction, we would say that the curvature of this curve is negative. And of course, I'm talking about this point right here, right? By the time we get over here, the curvature normal will, of course, point in this direction, right? And we would say that here, this curve is negatively curved, and then, if you want to be complete, you will have to say with respect to our choice of the unit normal field. Does that make sense? So that's one difference. Uh, another difference is that if we look at this point of inflection, where it goes from being curved one way to being curved the other way, an interesting thing happens. Again, let's assume that we've already made this choice, pointing this way, and we're sticking with it. Then in this section right here, the normal equals the principal normal because they're both unit normals pointing in that direction. And then here, the principal normal flips and starts pointing this way. The drawing's becoming a little messy, but I hope you guys are bearing with me. This is an interesting point. There, we have them both. So the normal, the unit normal points this way because that was our arbitrary choice. And the principal normal which is not arbitrary, it's predestined by the curve points this way. And so here they start pointing in the opposite directions. An interesting thing happens at this point, at the point of inflection. There's no problem at all with the unit normal. Not at all, right? It existed at that point without a care in the world before we ever started taking any derivatives. It just comes with the curve and it's completely this point is completely not special 
when it comes to the concept of the normal direction. But what's the principal normal at this point? Well, at this point, you can uh, intuit that B, the curvature normal, is zero. Because it goes from uh, pointing this way to maybe pointing the same way but less long, and then pointing the other way. So there's a point in the middle where it equals zero. And so when B equals zero, you cannot, it does not define the principal normal because it doesn't have a direction, right? Essentially, in words, P is the unit vector in the direction of B. But if B is zero, you just don't have P. And in fact, you don't have P because there's no way to define it in a way that would be continuous because on this side, I should have used a different color for the principal normal. But, you know, this is curvature normal. It's, you know, and here it is. So everything that's from last lecture is red now, right? And in this section, the principal normal coincides with the normal, right? Oh, sorry, here. So at this point, the principal normal simply is not defined. So just contrasting, I'm contrasting here uh, small but important differences between the unsigned or absolute curvature and the signed or mean curvature. The last thing I'll mention is that the mean curvature or signed curvature uh, can actually be given algebraically and of course the expression for it, what we said in words has actually a very simple algebraic expression. We said that it's the magnitude of B when the two point in the same direction and minus the magnitude of B if they point in opposite directions. That can actually be expressed via this dot product. Do you guys agree? This is precisely the expression. It seems like overkill to go for the dot product when all you want to say is the length of and it's with a sign. But I actually think this is quite elegant, very short expression, and it summarizes exactly what we wanted to say. So it's quite nice. So it seems like, given how we arrived here, that this unit normal field is like an after, a little bit of an afterthought, like an add-on. But hopefully you'll think about it the other way. This is actually a more basic notion, because like I said, it comes with the curve just by looking at dimensions and space without even differentiating, right? And so please try to see it that way also, right? When you have a curve, you have the tangent space and you have the normal space. The normal space is one dimensional, so it's down to one vector or minus that vector. So it comes automatically with the curve. And so next time when we're studying surfaces, once we, we have a surface in two dimensions, just think of it as automatically having the normal direction. You know, it's something that just geometrically comes with the surface, and then we can try and analyze it. Mm -hmm.